last uh, two years uh, with so much emphasis on STEM and not on social studies and history. Uh, but I've heard though recently that uh, there may be some uh, testing on social studies now. As much as I, I feel sorry for these kids only to be tested, <laughs> it does seem to define the curriculum. So is there going to be more emphasis on social studies and history? I think it's very important to connect and connecting kids to uh, where they live and a, a sense of really belonging and being involved in their communities. Yes, no, I totally agree. And that, that is happening. So um, there, as I mentioned, there is a review of the English language arts and math curriculum, which is underway and almost complete. Um, we are in the process of launching a similar review process for the history standards. And at the end of that process, we'll be rolling out a new assessment, at, I think grades five, eight, and 10. <clears throat> and um, this, um, I, uh, back in the day, I chaired the board of uh, what was then called the Board of Education. And one of my uh, sort of final acts uh, before leaving the board was to adopt a regulation to establish what was then the 10th grade history uh, social science assessment as part of the graduation requirement. That requirement was waived back in 2008 or nine, I think, um, and it hasn't come back. And I think we need to bring it back, and not just because I want to test kids and make their lives miserable, but because um, you know one of the core purposes of a public education is to build strong citizens. And in order to be an effective citizen, you need to understand your country, you need to understand your public institutions. Um, and as important as English and math is, uh, history and social science and civics more broadly um, is equally important. So we need to elevate that to make sure we're not shortchanging it, to make sure our children and our young people are coming out of high school and, and going on into the, into the real world with the kind of civic skills that they need to be successful and to contribute to our society. One here and then over here. I'm, I'm actually still over here for some oh, side thing. Uh, Joanne Sullivan, North Shore Community College. Good morning. Mm -hmm. um, my question has to do with the early college policy that you were speaking about. Um, I am the director of grants <coughs> at the college, and we recently received the day graded college grant uh, through the Bar Foundation to plan and implement for a day graded college program that serves at risk high school students. I spend a lot of time pursuing opportunities to fund early college. So I'm just interested in how the funding and the different initiatives will come together to meet policy. Yeah. And funding as well, but yeah. yes. So uh, we're working that out. Um, but I think it's going to be some combination. Well, well in the last um, two budgets, um, the administration has proposed doubling the dual enrollment plan. Um, and so part of the solution will be just providing more resources for that kind of uh, access to, uh, to higher education for high school students. Um, but equally important and more important in terms of taking this early college idea of greater scale um, <clears throat> is to think about how to better integrate the resources between higher education and K-12 and how to provide additional resources for on the, on, the, uh, on the high school side to support students and to support schools in, in creating that broader access. So I think it's some combination of, of more resources for dual enrollment programs, uh, figuring out how to connect um, dual enrollment and college credits, and early college in particular, to the way in which we fund high schools through our Chapter 70 program as well. Um, there's been, there was a report that was done by the Parthenon Group, which um, basically estimated that somewhere around $700 to $900 per pupil in additional cost for high school students who are part of early college programs. Um, I don't know whether that number is exactly right, but there's probably some additional uh, increment that will be necessary to support more students um, through those pathways in order to provide that kind of early college experience. Great, good questions here, and then we'll come back here. Yeah, good morning, Jim. Thank you for coming and, and talking to us with uh, your three quarters voice. Uh, I'm, Richard, <laughs> uh, I'm Richard Eister. Um, I've, I've just moved uh, to Massachusetts from New York City, um, and down there, I've been very much involved for the last 20 years uh, in addressing the issue of the keeping young teachers in the classroom. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I think we all know the statistics of how, how many idealistic young teachers leave within the first five years, quit the profession altogether. And I'm just uh, curious, as, as somebody new to Massachusetts, 
is this problem, you know, how is this problem being addressed? Is it being addressed? Is it, is this, do you recognize it as a serious problem as well? And I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you. Um, it's definitely a serious problem and challenge. Um, I think there are a couple of thoughts I have on this. One is just the, the nature of um, young people coming into careers is, and their expectations is just different than it was maybe when, when you or I launched our careers. <clears throat> uh, in particular, the idea that, that you're gonna spend your entire career doing the same thing, certainly in the same place, um, is not necessarily something that everyone sort of aspires to. Um, and so the, the fact that there's turnover should not be surprising, but the rate of that turnover is higher than, uh, uh, is healthy for a, a healthy public education system. So we can't pretend we can go back to the days where young people are gonna come into the profession and stay for 30 or 40 years. But that same token, getting them to stay for five to 10 years as opposed to two to three uh, would be a big step in the right direction. So that's the first thing. The second <clears throat> is um, that ultimately I believe teachers stay in the profession when they feel they're successful. Um, there are certainly issues around compensation and work in, workplace environment, a whole bunch of other things that can make your life either great or lousy when you have a job, regardless of whether it's a school or anywhere else. But if, as a teacher, you can feel like you're having an impact on children, that you're moving them from where they are to where they need to be, that you are succeeding, that's what keeps people in the profession. That's what keeps them coming back. And the last thing, and this gets back to sort of what I was talking about earlier around school empowerment, um, is ultimately, I think, successful teachers who have impact on students work in successful schools. Um, and in some ways that sounds axiomatic, like if you have a successful, if you have successful teachers, then you'll have successful schools. I think the dynamic is more complicated than that. Um, and that what you need are you need these institutions, these small institutions called schools, to have not only the authority to act, but the capacity to act in a way that allows them to have that positive impact on students' lives, to build cultures that respect teachers, that support their development, and that encourage them and, and hold them accountable um, for, um, for moving their children along. And that, that combination of things, I think, is what ultimately is gonna address this question of teacher turnover. I don't think you can, you can think about it solely in this one dimension, about somehow there's some policy we can do, whether it's a compensation or something else, that will keep teachers in the game. I think the way to keep teachers in the game is to have great schools. And that's a hard, that's a hard task, but I think that's the challenge that's before us. Jim, I think that's a very articulate answer, and I think you're right. I think we will have our last question. <coughs> well, my name's Lois Sargent. I'm from Salem, and I'd like to be known as a poet. But, um, <laughs> this is the poet's uh, file right here. <laughs> We're together. <laughs> <but> <laughs> <so>. um, <laughs> at the moment, I'm retired. But um, I, I was always interested in my community. When my children were growing up, I would drag them around to all the various uh, campaigns or organizations that I was involved in, and I eventually did write a, a book that has been called A Civic Lesson for Children, because my kids were so just, uh, confused about the different activities that we did. Um, but my question and is uh, kind of also relates to what Terry Tori was uh, speaking about. I'm concerned about the proliferation of private school when I was in my generation, kids went to public school or a religious school. Now there are so many private schools, and the public schools seem to be paying the price for this. And the public schools are really of major importance. I mean, this is what helped our country grow. We gave everyone a chance for public education. And I'd like you to kind of speak to that. And what Tori was saying, even the um, uh, people like myself who grew up and went to the public school, a lot is missing because we don't have the privileges to contact people who are uh, better uh, uh, positions than all have. And I, I fear that we're developing uh, an elite, an educated and an elite So I'm not sure, um, just from a trend point of view, whether a, a, 
private school to the private sector is growing and it's been actually pretty stable over the years. Um, and I, I'm someone who does believe pretty strongly in, in empowering parents to make choices on behalf of their children and not to, um, in some ways, force them, if you will, into a, into a school or environment that they don't feel is right for their child. Um, so I think that kind of choice is good. I think having a rich, uh, diverse educational sector, including private and public schools, is a good thing. Um, that doesn't mean that public schools are going away, and nor obviously nor should they. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a zero-sum game where if you have private schools, that means your public schools. If you have strong private schools, that means your public schools are worse. I don't, I don't know why this isn't a both-and situation. I think we just need to concentrate on making our public schools as strong as they can possibly be. Uh, I think that's the work that, that, that I'm certainly about, that our administration is about, and I think that all of you are about. Um, and I don't think, again, I don't really think they're in conflict. Um, I think it's there's huge value in the experience that young people get in public schools by being with their peers in a community uh, that cuts across all boundaries. I think we know even within public education, there are there continue to be divisions across all of these different lines. We need to work to try to, to bring those together and across those but by the same token, again, I, I think there are, the, there are competing values here. One of them is uh, ensuring that parents do have options, and I, I think that's a good thing. Thank you very much, Secretary Kaiser, for sharing. Sharing your thoughts in the direction of the administration with us for launching our winter policy series here for the um, Alliance for bringing a lot of new faces into this group. There are a number of people that are here for the first time, and I think a wonderful cross-section of educators and beyond that have joined in the room. And I want to just say a particular thanks to the members of the Board of Trustees of both the Community College and Salem State University that have joined us today as volunteer leaders. You help us so much with the work that they're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>